little kind of exercise survey and you're just gonna raise your hand um, if you agree. And if you disagree, just leave your hands down. With the uptick in COVID and uncertainty with the economy, how many of you are worried about the future? Do you feel that you have a firm notion of what right is and what wrong is? Do you feel the collective notion, either globally or the US or wherever you're from, of right and wrong have been blurred in recent years? How many of you have ever struggled with doing the right thing because it could cause you material, material or emotional harm? Okay. So you, for the next part, you can just kind of top right hand side, move it back to um, speaker mode. Um, so the focus on this Let's Talk is on doing the right thing. Um, our special guest for today is Lisa Bowman, who's the Chief Mojo Officer at uh, Marketing Mojo. Um, for those of you, um, mute someone real quick, sorry. For those of you that are new to Let's Talk, there's one singular purpose of these Let's Calls. How do you create an environment where participants can help support each other during this global um, pandemic? And more than ever, we need to come together as a community to support and uplift each other. And the whole goal is, you know, to build these deep connections online, but then also connect with each other via LinkedIn or email so you can kind of continue those relationships uh, moving forward. So about Let's Talk, there's no presentation, there's no talking heads. This is an open discussion and a dialogue where the group supports each other. So, um, you know, for the next part, I'm just going to kind of give you um, a quick, before I introduce Lisa, um, you know, I kind of mentioned that today's discussion is on doing the right thing. And I usually do a lot of research before these Let's Talk. And I realized while I was doing the research for this call that I was going down a rabbit hole. What seems like a relatively easy question, right, what's the right thing to do, becomes really complicated. And the more I pose the question, the more I realize that I have no clue what, what the right thing means. You know, all of us have asked the question, am I doing the right thing at one point in our life? And sometimes the hardest thing and the right things are one and the same. It also becomes complicated as the world has become increasingly divided and polarized. So doing the right thing has become really complicated as the US political divide has shown us. Then there's the religious divide, generational divide. What's right can be someone else's wrong. So I'm not here to talk about what's right or wrong for everyone on this call, because I really don't know the answer, but I do know that what's right is a decision you need to make for yourself. So I think it goes back um, to the let's talk we had a few months ago with Barbara Leahy about the value, how our values should become our North Star. So what are the things that you value the most in the world? And are you living in alignment with those values? So during that call on values, Adrian Wallace, who, who's a, per, a regular on these calls, shared an example of how she valued health. And she got a dream job offer that would have been high profile in the C-suite, would have paid her an exorbitant amount of money, but it would have comprised, uh, compromised her value as it was in the tobacco, tobacco industry. So I think you know that you are in the right direction when you're able to sleep right and soundly at the end of the night, whatever that right thing is. So during this Let's Talk, we're gonna be discussing why it's so important to do the right thing. <laughs> One of the things I firmly believe that heroes come in all sizes, but they have one common um, perspective. And it's that doing right is more important than doing what's easy. So this is the thing, Hero do, heroes do the right thing, even when it is overwhelmingly difficult. So one of my heroes in my eyes is Lisa Bowman. Lisa um, is a chief mojo officer at Marketing Mojo. She's an award-winning marketer with over 15 years of progressive experience at uh, UPS, which is a Fortune 50 company. After her career at UPS, Lisa became the CMO of United Way, um, and that's where I met her. Um, recently, 
she's kind of had to make some really difficult decisions in her life, ones that could have lasting personal and professional ramifications. So this Let's Talk um, came up relatively recently. Um, I was on a phone call with Lisa probably a week ago, and we had this conversation about the challenges that she's faced. At the end of the call, Lisa shared with me that growing up, her grandmother used to tell her that you can never go wrong by doing right. And she's lived that philosophy throughout her life. So I'm going to, you know, I'm not here to kind of tell Lisa's story. I want to kind of hear her kind of share her voice and her story um, about, you know, kind of the challenges she's faced recently, but also kind of her philosophy, how it's been shaped growing up. So Lisa, do you want to kind of uh, take it away? Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. So um, as Lynn said, this, this was a philosophy that um, I was taught by my grandmother, right, who always said that you can never go wrong by doing right. And ironically, and I, I said this to Lynn yesterday, today happens to be my grandmother's birthday. Um, she would have been 102. She passed away five years ago at 97. But even until about three weeks before we lost her, um, she was completely with it mentally. And I used to joke that sometimes on her worst day, she was better than I am on my best day. Um, the woman absolutely knew what was going on uh, socially, with news, with everything else. And she was just really a very practical lady, a very smart lady, and a very tough lady. And I think that... Um, you know, I'm going to share a video with you that's really quick, but when they say a picture is worth a thousand words, this video will really prove it. And before Lan runs the video, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context for it. And this video was taken by my grandmother on her iPhone when she was about 94. So yes, she had an iPhone. Yes, she knew how to use it. Um, she was on blood thinners that caused some bruising and she had fallen out of bed. Um, and so this video is my grandmother letting me know what had happened. You want a piece of me, bitch? So um, this is a 94-year-old lady with just a, a crazy sense of humor, right? So I get this video from her showing me this awful bruise on her face saying, do you want a piece of me, bitch? Um, and, and this is somebody that was very influential to me growing up. She, she had a master's degree, um, which for women at that time was very, very unusual. Um, when my grandfather was recovering from a heart attack that he had at a very young age, my grandmother stepped in and ran his business very successfully. Um, I, you know, we both had an affinity for Winnie the Pooh and we found conversation and wisdom on the things that he would say to Piglet. And my grandmother was very um, influential because she gave me two really good pieces of advice. The first one was that you have two ears and one mouth and make sure that you use them in proportion. The second one was today's topic, which is you can never go wrong by doing right. And so that is really the latter is a guiding principle that I've used throughout my life and my career. It's sort of been my moral guidepost. Um, but, you know, there's a couple of incidents that I can think of that really bring this forward, right? Growing up, um, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and I lived about five blocks away from my elementary school. And so we walked to school in the morning. We came home from lunch, walked back to school after lunch, and then home after school. And on the way to school, then we had this local neighborhood store called Paul's. Um, and Paul's was where we would go to buy candy or our parents in those days would send us with a note that it was okay to buy a pack of cigarettes and bring them home for our parents. Um, you know, different times. But when I was probably in fifth grade. Um, I got pressured by some kids who were stealing candy from Paul's. And so I stole candy too. I wanted to be cool, but I felt really bad about it because that just wasn't aligned with who I was. And so I went back after school, after we'd all gone home, I walked back up to the store and I was honest with Paul and I told him that I had stolen candy from him. Um, I'd actually stolen Jumbo Tootsie Rolls and those are my absolute favorite candy, the really big ones. 
Um, but Paul thanked me for doing the right thing, for being honest, and told me that as a reward for being honest, I could keep the Tootsie Rolls. Um, but he also, in the background, called my mother and told my mom what had happened, and she was absolutely not happy with me. Um, my younger brother also subscribed to some extent to my grandmother's theory, um, but took it a little bit too far in my senior year of high school during senior ditch day. Um, so my brother was very social. Everybody knew my brother. I was kind of the quiet kid. Um, but my brother was asked by the school administrators if he had any idea where the senior class was as we ditched school about a month before graduation. And he did the right thing. He answered a question honestly and outed the fact that we were all at the beach and the school administrators showed up at the beach and ruined our senior ditch day. So my brother spent the remainder of the school year being driven to school by my mother so that he did not get his ass kicked uh, by taking the bus or <laughs> waiting for the bus, right? So that's an example of when you can take it too far. But as I said, as I got older and went off to college and subsequently to work, um, that mantra of my grandmother's really was that guidepost that I used when I was faced with crises of the conscience, you know, when asking myself, is this the right thing? As long as I could check the yes box for myself after looking at it, I knew that I was on solid ground. Um, and I, you know, at some point, as I started to get a little bit older, I think doing the right thing also got morphed into understanding if something felt right, right? One was action, the other was intuition. So am I doing the right thing? And does this feel like the right thing is happening? Um, so one of the examples of that for me is that when I was about 25, I had moved from Chicago to Atlanta. Um, I chased a boy here and whole another story for another day. Um, but the largest competitor of the company that I worked for in Chicago was based here in the outskirts of Atlanta. And they had offered me a job in sales, which is what I did in Chicago. I sold printed circuit boards to the automotive industry. Um, and so they had offered me a very similar role. The week before I was supposed to start my job, they called me and asked me to come in and meet with them. And when I got there, they sat me down and told me that they wanted to change my role um, and not give me the job that they had offered me and the job that I had accepted. The automotive accounts that I would be dealing with here, as they explained to me, honey, because we're in the South, um, were small OEMs, that they were small manufacturers based in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. And while I had done a bunch of travel from Chicago to manufacturing in the Midwest, and that was never a problem, um, they seemed to feel that for a young lady, that was not really the right environment and proceeded to tell me that in the South, it was very frequent for them to entertain their clients and do business with these guys at gentlemen's clubs. And they just didn't think that was the right thing. So even though I had a background in sales, they were gonna give me another job and have me manage what they referred to as the customer service ladies. And I walked out, I didn't have a job. Um, I just knew that, that did not feel right. It didn't feel right to me that that's how they were doing business. It didn't feel right to me that they had given me a job and then I felt pulled sort of a bait and switch and changed my job. And the whole thing about this not being the right environment for a young lady didn't feel right to me as well. So I, I walked out and, you know, a whole nother story, but I subsequently found a job and that's ultimately how I, how I ended up at UPS. But I've always been a believer that if you keep your head down and if you do a good job and you're a good person and do the right thing, Right? You should come out on the right side of things. That that's, those are the four basic things that you should be doing. And you know, not to make it political, but I, when Lynn asked the question about the lines between right and wrong getting blurred in today's environment, I think I saw almost every hand go up. And we've seen a lot of that, right? We've seen people that aren't doing the right thing and are getting away with it and people that aren't really seeming to care as much anymore when people aren't doing the right thing. We've seen people that are doing the right thing getting punished 
um, people that have testified in political cases. I, I think the most recent one for me is I was watching 60 Minutes on Sunday night and they had the guy from um, the cybersecurity agency that validated the fact that our election was safe and secure, right? And he got fired because he did the right thing, he did his job and somebody didn't like what he had to say or the outcome of him doing his job. Um, so we've seen whistleblowers that are doing nothing more than what they're supposed to do, doing their job, following policy, reporting things that they're supposed to, and then they subsequently lose their job. And so what we see happen in society is that the people that step forward to raise the visibility of wrongdoing seem to really become the bad guys in some cases when technically they're the victims right, lost their jobs or they've been subjected to other things. And so for me, as Lan said, I, I've recently had another personal flashpoint, which was probably maybe one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But again, my grandmother's voice was ringing loud and clear in my head. Um, as Lan said, I, I recently worked at United Way and in that organization, um, myself and many others were victims of harassment in the workplace. Um, many of us, not all of us, but many of us by a single perpetrator. And by policy, as a supervisor, as the department head, as the CMO, when I had my folks coming to me, making me aware of what was going on, I raised the issues to HR. These were women that were more junior than I was. They were not comfortable going to HR not comfortable certainly going to HR to rat out, if you will, a member of the executive team, one of my peers that was being inappropriate. And at the same time, I was trying to raise the issues on their behalf and protect them. I was also being subjected to the same issues by the same perpetrator. Um, and finally, I had to go to HR because I had an issue where I was publicly humiliated by this man in a very public event in front of others and really made to feel that my worth was not at all in my work product or my talent or what I brought to the table from a work perspective, but only in my appearance um, and how I presented. And that really was the snap moment for me because I was so embarrassed, I was so humiliated he had done this to me, a member of the executive team, in front of a number of subordinates. And it just was a very uncomfortable moment. And so for doing the right thing, ultimately, I ended up paying the ultimate price because I began to endure a systemic pattern of retaliation from my boss, who was the CEO. Um, when I, early in this process, asked him if he was aware of the fact that I had been forced to go to HR, about this person, um, his response to me was, yes, I'm aware of that, but you just need to learn to get along with him. And that should have been the red flag for me. Um, unfortunately, again, I am a big believer and you do the right thing and everything should work out. Um, but as time progressed, I started having resources taken off of my team. My team was already overworked, right? All of us as marketers know that feeling. Um, and not only were they taken away from me, they were given to my harasser and put on his team, but I was still held accountable for delivering that work. Um, he froze my ability to backfill those resources or hire anybody. Um, I was taken off the agenda from presenting to the board, whereas I had always been a standing part of that agenda to present on our marketing initiatives. Um, while my team was worn out from not having resources and being forced to really do the job of a team that should have essentially been double the size, um, morale started to decline and that was all put on me. And then finally, after nine months of this, I was called into the CEO's office um, just randomly and told that I wasn't needed anymore. No explanation, go get with HR and work something out. Essentially, by Felicia, we don't need you. Um, and all of this happened right at the start of COVID, um, literally right as the world was about to tilt left. And so for me, it was a couple of months of really struggling, right? I, how did this happen? 
I, I did the right thing, right? This is the code that I've always gone by. You, you can't go wrong by doing right. And I did the right thing. I followed policy. I raised this. I was professional about it. I didn't react to him. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I took care of my people. Um, I was a good girl. I didn't speak up about my own issues until I couldn't take it anymore. And where was the HR team and, and the protectors of the employees? Like, where were these folks? And how did this go so wrong when all I did was the right thing, right? Morally, ethically, by policy. Um, and so over the next couple of months, I really struggled with this. And I, you know, finally, I realized that I did have the ability, quite frankly, to actually try and write this and do something about it. Um, even though I wasn't there anymore. And so it was a very difficult process. Um, it was a scary process. And as Lan said, it came at risk, both personally and professionally. But again, I kind of knew it was the right thing to do. Every time I questioned myself and said, should I be doing this? I came back to, yes, it's the right thing to do. And that right thing was to go to the media and out my former employer for this behavior. Um, and so I, I think in the invitation to this, Lan had included a link. I don't know if everybody had a chance to read it, but the um, the HuffPost covered this uh, the week of Thanksgiving. And it's, you know, it's been a very scary journey. Um, as I shared with somebody this morning, I've started to have these little anxiety attacks, which are new for me, that's never happened because going up against a big, well-known company. Um, it's a scary thing to do. And candidly, I was very fortunate in the fact that somebody had my back, somebody that had been through this and been through it much worse than I had, which is Gretchen Carlson, um, who was an anchor on Fox, who really outed and essentially took down Roger Ailes and started the Me Too movement. And Gretchen and I had a chance meeting through a mutual connection and she was very instrumental in putting her finger in my back through this process and really saying, you know what, stand up, you can do this, you can do this. Um, and so while none of this is resolved and yes, I'm unemployed and trying to do some consulting and probably have a very long legal road ahead of me, um, I, you know, it really was the right thing to do. And, the number of people that have reached out to offer support, to thank me for stepping forward for them because they couldn't do it has been overwhelming. Um, I spoke with somebody this morning that shared an experience that she had had at another really large company and basically said like, I didn't, I should have, but I didn't. And so I, I firmly believe that we're each brought into this world with a greater purpose than serving ourselves. And for me, the right thing was that if I could stop this from happening to just one more person, because my perpetrator is still there, he's still in a position of power, he's been promoted, and I know that this is his MO, this is his behavior, and it's not going to stop until these folks are, are held accountable. So throughout the whole journey, every time I kept saying, is this the right thing to do? Even up until the last moment before the article broke, his name was in the article until the Saturday before it dropped. It dropped on the Monday of Thanksgiving week. And I called the journalist on Saturday when I found out that the article was dropping. And I said, I need you to take his name out of the article. And she was like, why? He needs to be held accountable. And I said, he does. I said, but at the end of the day, I said, well, he's caused me a tremendous amount of pain. Number one, I'm concerned for my own safety because I don't think he's stable. Number two, I'm actually concerned for his safety because I don't think he's stable. And to out somebody like that in public can have some very severe consequences on somebody's life. And when it really comes down to it, the reality is, is that he was simply the catalyst for what happened to me, but my real issue was with the CEO who didn't do the right thing and addressed the situation and subsequently did the wrong thing and retaliated against me and took my career off track. So again, it was sort of that moral checkbox from my grandmother 
right? Is this the right thing to do? And I had to ask that question knowing that his name was in the article. Um, so, you know, again, I just, it's difficult. It's much easier sometimes to do the easier thing than do the right thing. I could have shut up. I could have negotiated a package. I could have gone away quietly. And I didn't do any of that because this needs to stop. And it needs to stop, not just for the people that are still at United Way, but I would be willing to bet that there are a number of people on this call that could raise their hands today and say that, yes, I have faced this in the workplace. And the more people stay silent and they're forced into complicity by being made afraid, um, the more this just continues and we don't get resolution. So with that, um, I actually tripped across a cartoon that was a, a conversation between Pooh and Piglet uh, that's really relevant to this conversation. And just knowing that today is my grandmother's birthday, this sort of came from her um, and what we're talking about. I will ask Lan to share that cartoon and give you guys all a second to read it because I think it's, it's really a testament to the conversation that we just had. Okay, if I read it, promise yeah, sure. me you'll always remember you're braver than you believe and stronger than you seem and smarter than you think. Oh, love that. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story, Lisa. Um, I'm just going to read some of the comments um, from folks um, in the chat room. Um, never veer from doing the right thing. That's what uh, what's called integrity. Thank you, Lisa. I'm behind you all the way. Um, leadership with integrity is rare and I commend you. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I think there's a collective we support you. So tell us how we can support you. You know, I, I shared the article with the folks um, who are on this call. Like what are, what are the things, what are the next steps what are the things that you wish support you can get or what are, how can we kind of collectively use our kind of like contacts and resources to help? Thank you. I, you know, this stuff does not change unless people stand up and demand change. And what was really unfortunate in this case is that United Way has two boards. Those two boards are made up of a who's who of corporate America. And my case was the third EEOC charge filed against United Way for this kind of behavior within a one year period. And I wrote to the board. Um, I made them aware of this and told them that they really needed to do something and to look into it. And they did nothing. Um, and candidly, I gave them a chance to do the right thing too, because I probably, could have pulled the story back had the board told me that they would address it. And when they didn't, it became really clear to me that the only way to get some action here and raise visibility was to go to the media and to get this story out there. So the one thing I would ask all of you is this story is pinned to my LinkedIn profile. I would ask you to please comment like it, I can see that United Way is monitoring my LinkedIn. They're looking for the reactions. So please share it with your networks um, and help get the word out there, not in the context of bad mouthing United Way, but as a story of what happens and what needs to stop. Um, and don't be afraid to stand up. It's a tough thing to do, but you never know who you might be helping by doing this and who you might be candidly protecting or stopping this from happening to by standing up and saying something. So one of the things um, this kind of makes me think of is, you know, we had uh, Nandini, um, who was kind of a, one of the founders of um, Sleeping Giants come. Um, and one of the things they did was they kind of basically hit who were advertising in Breitbart in some of these uh, really kind of like um, racist, misogynist publications, what they did was they just did like, uh, it was mainly kind of an online kind of campaign. 
where they ask followers to basically reach out to the advert, not the publishers, but the, the advertisers and just kind of alert to them that Breitbart would like had all of these kind of negative ads that were that were sexist, that were demeaning towards rate like various races. And they were able to kind of reduce Breitbart's um, advertising dollars by 90%, right? And so, um, I mean, I don't know how we, we create a vehicle for that, but um, I feel like there, there are ways to kind of bring the community together to kind of tackle this. Because the thing is, unless um, they feel like there's, it's gonna hit their bottom line, change doesn't happen. You're exactly right. And unless there's some pressure on them and unfortunately on the companies that support them, um, nothing is going to change. And so I would say if you work for a company that runs a United Way campaign, raise visibility of this to your CSR team or your HR team or whoever oversees that. Um, you know, the, the really unfortunate thing and where I struggled with this candidly a little bit was that ethical dilemma of United Way does do some good work. So by outing them, if they take a financial hit, are the real people that suffer the people that get serviced by United Way? But at the end of the day, United Way is not a direct service provider. They're a pass-through organization. They take the money in, they pay it out to the other organizations. So people will continue to give to those other organizations directly, just not through United Way. Yeah. So to the extent, and again, this is not me pushing this on you, but I would just say if you feel compelled, um, social media is our friend, right? Take to Twitter, tag United Way, demand change. Um, tag Time's Up in it, tag Gretchen in it, tag United Way, tag me and see if we can make some noise because again to land's point the only way that this stops is if people start to feel some pressure and that pressure has to either be put on united way in a public domain or put on the companies that support them and i will just share with you there there is another article coming um this one is no less scary than the first one i would think that by now after that first one dropped I would be like, okay, yeah, I've been there, done it, no big deal. Just as scary um, to know that the second one is coming. So there will be more media probably next week. I don't know for sure by another reputable publication. Um, but if anybody has contacts that you think can be helpful in sharing the story, in raising visibility of this, um, I would be super appreciative because again, too many times people are forced to stay quiet and that's how this stuff happens. It happens through companies instilling fear in you and through the use of NDAs, which silence people, right? They take a settlement in exchange for an NDA. And even though as part of my separation, they offered me a really ridiculous small settlement, it came with shut up papers. And to me, it was far more important to walk away from that and get some visibility on what's happening here, knowing that people contribute to United Way, thinking that their money is being used to help those in need. And what I've seen in the last year is that money is going to defend EEOC filings and lawsuits. Yeah. So um, normally we do breakout groups, but this is not the time to do that. So I kind of want to open it up. Um, and we have like about 10 or more minutes if you guys are okay are you guys okay with it just kind of like bring a broader conversation instead of the breakout groups yeah okay so um if you guys want to maybe unmute yourself and if we have time then i'll do a breakout group um if you guys have any kind of like if you want to kind of share your own experience in terms of um kind of having that dilemma between right and wrong and um oh one other thought before i ask that question Please follow Lisa. Lisa, can you add your LinkedIn profile to the yeah. chat? I want all, all of you guys to follow her. As she mentioned, there's probably going to be more press that are coming out. If we can kind of amplify her voice and share it, um, if there's folks you know, um, you know, where you can kind of share the message. This is kind of how we 
amplify the message in our community and we make real change is by coming together. Um, and this is the whole notion of community of seven. It's the whole notion of um, these let's talk is bringing people together to actually make the world a better place, right? And it comes from having brave voices like Lisa, but also the community coming together to tell her, you know, you're protected. You've got this whole collective community behind you. And that's how change is, is happening. And that's how we become more brave by having like a bigger community behind us, right? So um, does anyone want to share anything? You could just um, unmute yourself. It doesn't have to be kind of related to kind of what Lisa shared. It could be really about anything. Um, you know, I know we've talked about, you know, our experiences being BIPOC executives in the workforce. I know I've had a lot of conversations about, um, you know, um, uh, you know, like doing the right things even though it might cost you your job or whatnot. Does anyone want to share anything? I'll share, um, Lan. Um, this is kind of how I got involved um, in the work I'm doing now. And I really appreciate your story, Lisa. I've had a similar story. Um, I came across a statistic that 50% of women who study engineering leave mid-career. And there's this huge push for women in STEM. But they're not staying in STEM. And it's mostly because of these type of issues. So I posted in the chat uh, two new movies that have come out, which I think um, uh, Picture a Scientist and Pioneers in Skirts. Picture a Scientist uh, was shown in Congress a couple days ago. And pictures, uh, uh, the other one, um, so they both recently come out this year. They have not been widely distributed because of COVID, but you can find the trailers online. And I think it's a real easy way to engage a conversation with your workplace um, because it's kind of low risk. And um, what it shows is, you know, 50% of women in academics are sexually harassed. Now, when the statistics get that high, you can't deny it's happening. I mean, it's happening at MIT, it's happening here, it's happening there. And um, so I, I feel things happening. I'm participating with American Society of Civil Engineers and participating in Society of Women Engineers that we get the voice out that it's not just women talking to women, that this is like, I, you know, 30 years ago, I was part of the affirmative action generation. I never thought workplaces would be like this 30 years later. And it's, it's enough. Um, I totally agree with Lisa that, you know, if you, you know, you need, I've done so many informational interviews and every woman I speak to has a story. Like that is not acceptable. Yeah. I think one of the, the things that, um, the hard part is when you speak up, you could be ostracized, you could be fired, you could, you know, you don't want to be the one. It's because it's scary to be the one. However, we need more people speaking up because when you, br when you bring this to the light, that's how it's actually dealt with. So if you kind of look at the Me Too movement and kind of how fast that accelerated and also times up, it was that collective strength of people coming together saying, no more, this needs to stop. And I think that's what's so powerful about Lisa kind of speaking up against this huge organization that's been around for over 100 years um, and has some really well, you know, high like profile people on the board, you know, you have to sometimes take that risk if you really believe in those changes. Um, and Carly, Carly, I, oh, did someone just speak? Sorry. I, I was just gonna say to Preeti's point and to your point, Time's Up just did a study in October, 70% of women that had contacted the National Women's Law Center, which is affiliated with Time's Up, 70% of them talked about the fact that after they'd reported harassment, they were retaliated against. That is not okay. No, it's not. Um, um, I wanted to add a, a quick point. Um, first of all, Lisa, thank you for sharing your story. I think that um, I can't imagine how scared you are. Um, I, I think that, um, 
you know, to, to speak up, especially against an organization of that size and, and as powerful as they are. And I have worked for many large corporations that have had mandatory support of the United Way, especially at the executive level, which um, I've never been a fan of. <laughs> um, and, not, and not that I don't want to support, um, you know, people in need, but, but not this way. Um, but what I wanted to, to talk about or, or share is the one thing that I find really encouraging is, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm doing some work with a startup and we are really focusing on being an ESG company and you know what that means, so environmental social governance um, type of organization. And from an investment perspective, there are more and more people that are really focused on making sure that ESG um, exists in the workplace and that companies are held accountable. So ESG basically means that, you know, you don't just focus on, on shareholder value, but you focus on stakeholder value. And stakeholder value includes everyone in that organization, you know, vendors, partners, customers, whoever that might be. Um, and to me, you know, I agree that certainly people need to speak up. But I also see that there are, um, I, I think people globally are starting to see the world in a different way. And they're starting to say, you know what, this is not okay. And if companies in the, in the future, and it'll take time, but if companies are going to be judged, not just on, you know, their, their shareholder return, but how they behave as an organization, um, I think that will help also. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that's such a really great point. Um, uh, Ren, just one point. Can I 